in October 1998 came the defining Warhammer 40k edition that would give the 40k universe much of its flavor the franchise is known for today, and with it, the embracing of the grimdark. To drop the humorous aspect of the tabletop war game for the most part, instead, they'd focus on a darker tone, with the narrative now being driven by the Imperium of Man. Now, it's it's kind of hard to tell just how big of an influence the third edition truly was on 40k, but a good example would be the change from 7th edition to 8th edition, the game overall taking a more simplistic and streamlined theme. Many gamers who started in 8th edition would encounter a much different game than their earlier iterations, and wouldn't need a PhD in Warhammer rules and 10 rule books and errata printouts just to play an army. With the coming of 3rd edition, it was a very similar situation. The game went from needing a whole different collection of dice similar to D&D dice, to just having the good old fashioned, reliable D6. There was still a bunch of crazy stuff going on, but the game was much more able for people from a wider audience to get into. It was more accessible, and not as intimidating to people looking in from the outside. The game's streamlining and strategy to open it up to a broader base was met with tons of resistance by proto-neckbeards. Many devout players were also annoyed that the game was simplified and didn't require a full-blown religious initiation to join. In any case, so, the change gave Warhammer 40k a considerable increase in popularity. There was definitely a hate from the base for a little while, and just like back then, the hate from the base but increase in growth mirrored the changes from 7th to 8th edition and the coming of the Primaris Marines. There are still many old generals that are not too happy about the Primaris Marines. But not too soon after the 3rd edition dropped, we got the codex for the ineffable Eldar. Fans got three different codices to go along with the space elves, including the first appearance of the sadistic Dark Eldar. We'll start with the Codex Eldar and then go into the supplement, Craft Worlds Eldar. Gone were the days of the Taste of the Rainbow Codex, and in was the Grimdark. In this version of the Eldar Codex, the art is toned down significantly from the second edition, with Jeff Taylor going more with a humble space elf posing for the camera. In the Craft World supplement, this nugget of gold features the avatar of Cain himself, which is much cooler art, and I definitely prefer the cover from the supplement. Codex Eldar was released in 1999, and as with the majority of GW artwork of the time, Everything was all black and white other than the cover itself. The illustrators are David Gallagher, Des Hanley, Jess Goodwin, Neil Hodgson, John Blanche, Paul Smith, and Nuala Kindred. GW regular Gab Thorpe wrote the codex itself, and he'd go on to have a very major impact on the hobby for years to come. Of course, the codex has the mandatory intro, explaining all the different Eldar factions and their unique cultures, and how the Eldar civilization was broken and shattered into many pieces. While the different Eldar factions do share some similar cultural aspects, the Eldar are not united, but separate autonomous entities. And just like in the modern lore, the Eldar are a declining and dying race in the 40k universe. But despite all their issues, the Eldar do have some things going for them such as being the most technologically advanced faction in the galaxy. It kind of evens the playing field a little bit, I guess. But they're still pretty much screwed. And like in pretty much all fantasy lore concerning elves, the Eldar are super arrogant and think of themselves above all other sentient races, even referring to humans as the racist slang term, Mon Kai. The Eldar playstyle favored thoughtful generals. The army is fast and has high leadership, as well as high skill with weapons. And that makes sense because each one of them is thousands of years old. However, with these awesome stats came high points costs to back that up, making the Eldar an elite army for the most part. But 
Though the faction does have many advantages, they are a glass hammer. Lesser to an extent than the Dark Eldar. But let's just say that the Eldar can dish out quite a lot of damage, but can't take it in return. Their armor, too, is not the best, and they have a low toughness, which made any general who utilized an Eldar army have to suffer pretty badly for any mistakes. Mistakes were severely punished, and they just didn't have the staying power that other factions had. Despite these flaws, though, in the hands of an experienced general, the army was terrifying. Not to mention the Eldar possessed the most powerful psychers in the game, but they also had the special rule called Fleet of Foot, giving the Eldar the ability to run, or it's called advance in modern 40k, which was unique to their theme at the time, essentially making them one of the fastest factions in the game. Where the third edition Eldar really shines though, are their unique models for the era. The factions have vibrant colors and elegant alien designs, just otherworldly enough to be anathema to human culture while still remaining sleek and cool. And some of these models are still around to this day, which is kind of hilarious. Though all in all, these were some of the best GW models at the time. Modern players will recognize the force organization chart which shows the required units to make army builds, as well as weapons, war gear, special rules, and everything you need to know to command this ancient race in the grim darkness of the far future. And by the throne world, the Eldar, even back in 3rd edition, had a ton of units to choose from. Pretty much uh, a lot of units found in the modern Eldar in 40k are there and easily recognizable. And the codex fluff is legit, too with nearly every single page of the codex having little lore quotes everywhere. The codex does kind of lack flexibility in units. Basically all Eldar warriors are highly specialized and only good at one thing, so back then it was important for generals to think ahead of time and uh, know what they're facing. Or in a tournament scene, they needed to know what they required in their army to cover all bases and be able to take on all comers which was slightly more difficult for the Eldar compared to other factions, but not a deal breaker at all. Going in blind could be a bad idea unless the players are utilizing tournament lists. If the Eldar general could gear their list to specific enemies, the army becomes much more formidable. And one thing to remember is back in these days, GW encouraged much more converting models. They still do in modern times, though it's not nearly as much of a thing. This is because down the line it led to copyright issues that led GW to kind of move away from models that they had in their codexes, but they didn't actually have physical models that they made to represent them. At the dawn of 7th edition, I actually suffered from this and was pretty pissed off, having to retire my Mesetic Spores from my Tyranid army. I made them out of wolfle balls and a hot glue gun, and they were amazing and awesome. I wish I still had them, but sadly I rage quit my Tyranian army shortly after because I thought with every new codex, they just got nerfed, whereas other armies got buffed and I just got pissed off and quit playing them. And uh, gotta say, I do completely regret selling them off. Anyway, the Eldar army was a complete joy to convert and customize with a wide variety of choices. Once a player had their HQ and troops, they were good to go, and could expand their army in any way they saw fit. Though at the time, just picking random units without a focused strategy led many casual players, or new players I guess, to think that the army was underpowered compared to other factions, which was anything but the reality of the matter to any experienced player or any general who knew what they were doing, this was obviously not the case. The army was incredibly powerful and could be built to take on any threat, with incredible efficiency at that. It just required more brain power and knowledge. The general needed to know what they were doing and what specific units should be purchased over others depending on their desired playstyles. This would not only save money, but would also help them not get wrecked by more experienced players over and over. And even though I said 3rd edition Eldar is a glass hammer, 
they did have some pretty hardy units even back then, like the coolest units in the army, the Wraith Guard and Wraith Lord. I've always really liked the ghost robots, but where third edition Eldar really shines is firepower. When playing against Codex, Eldar players had to think quickly and focus their forces because they could lose entire units really quick from just a single phase of Eldar shooting. Eldar also have sneaky units, fast units, gunline units, and some of the game's coolest looking vehicles at the time. Whereas the Imperials got metal boxes, Eldar vehicles were sleek and sexy. In any case though, Codex Eldar gave generals a plethora of tactics to choose from, and analyzation for what was the best units for what situations. So while the units themselves were pretty inflexible, the variety of different units and their strengths was very flexible. Jet bikes, vipers, swooping hawks, and howling banshees could get up and close in your face real quick. Whereas dire avengers, guardians, wraith guard, and heavy weapon platforms could bring the bear some pretty serious firepower, and their vehicles were not to be underestimated either. Codex Eldar armies revolved mostly around three different tactics for the most part though, despite any units that one brought to bear. The resilient army, the fast army, and the shooty army. However, the HQ leading the army also played a pretty big factor in strategy. In the Codex, we also find some pretty decent tips. There's a painting guide, as well as hobby instructions, with these tidbits kind of lacking in modern day 40k codices. The paint jobs on the models in the pictures are pretty decent. Not A++ tier masterclass found in all modern codices, but pretty good nonetheless. The third edition Eldar Codex probably wasn't as intimidating for new players who lacked artist experience, and the step-by-step -step instructions are excellent, though simplistic. However, some of the paint jobs are dope as f including this Wraith Lord decked out in lightning and space runes. But interestingly enough, the majority of war gear Eldar are known for are actually present in this third edition codex. It also includes vehicle upgrades, as well as three versions of psychic powers because, you know, Eldar. Exarchs too have their own unique list of special upgrade powers to support the army, giving the Eldar probably the most versatility in psychic powers in the game at the time. The main faction character in the Codex is the legendary Eldrad Uthran of the Uthwe craft world. This character plays a massive role in the lore overall, and it's no wonder he's found here as the main space elf character. His model's pretty cool, and he seems to have some excellent special rules. Eldrad allows the army to redeploy up to six inches after both players have finished deploying, but before the game starts, and also giving a plus one to a single reserve roll, which is awesome, and gives the army fantastic flexibility. A general utilizing Eldrad as their HQ could pretty easily trick an opponent during deployment or have no trouble going second. Excellent advantages. Significantly, if you could move to Alpha Strike key enemy units, shocking your opponent because they thought that they deployed them in a safe spot, but instead they get wrecked by Eldar OP shooting. <laughs> the other named characters in the Codex are non-existent in modern 40k, including Iyana Ariana, Nuadu Fireheart, but the Phoenix Lords are all there, which is interesting and fantastic, with their models still not even being updated 20 years later. Well, other than a couple of them, but the majority are these same ancient models. All in all, the 3rd edition Eldar Codex was excellent for any wargamer interested in the faction. The only thing it was really missing was uh, special rules for the very distinct and different craft worlds of the Eldar factions. But with the release of Codex Eldar Craft Worlds, the supplement gave Eldar players even more tools for their toolbox. All the awesome grimdark art in this supplement was by John Blanche, Carl Klopisky, and John Wigley. The cover artist is David Gallagher, and the codex was written by the legendary Gav Thorpe, Jervis Johnson, 
and Andy Chambers, and it contains rules for many craft world factions, including the most psychic faction, Uthwe, the hot tempered Sam Han, Aletok, Vialtan, and even the best faction of haunted robots, Iandin. Each of the craft worlds has its section with unique rules and lore, such as an inquisitor named Zevak, who refers to Iandin Eldar as necromancers. Iandin had suffered a cataclysm. High Fleet Kraken had attacked the spaceborne city and wiped out nearly every member of its population. So the Eldar used the souls of the dead to command artificially constructed avatar bodies made for war. The rules give the Wargamer unique troop choices and special rules to reflect the ghost warriors of Iandin. And all these craft world factions get this treatment. The images of the miniatures in the book are beautiful and more realistic in quality. The models don't seem as highly detailed as in the main Eldar Codex. The painting being a quality that any average painter could aspire to. But the most interesting part is that Yenid is mentioned in the Eldrad Uthran section. And this is all the way back in 3rd edition of 40k. So this lore has been around for a while. Yenid is the Eldar God of the Dead and took a pretty big part in resurrecting Rebute Gilliman. The Eldar God is the only one that can finally stop Eldar souls from being eaten by Slanesh upon death.